Thank you very much, Laszlo, for a wonderful presentation. And thanks everyone that participated by contributing with their questions. And now uh, we're approaching the end of, of the program of the day. Obviously, there is going to be a reception left, but it's a great honor for me to introduce Kent Larson. Kent, you know, is a, a professor here at the Media Lab, and also he's an experienced architect, and he's going to talk to us about new networks and urban transformation. Please help welcome Kent. Thank you, uh, Cesar. I'm going to switch gears, uh, go back in time, and uh, do a brief history of cities, uh, <clears throat> which often started at a node, uh, a well. And the size of the settlement was, was limited to how far a person could walk with a, with a jug of water. Then we had, uh, we had pipes and aqueducts that could bring water in and sewers that could uh, take wastewater away. And eventually, we ended up with the basic form of some of the great cities that we love, like Paris. Uh, what's interesting um, uh, <clears throat> about this uh, map of Paris at this point in time, which is the mid-17th century, is you had, a, you had a, a, a node in the center. You could think of that as something like the central district. And you had four neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods were more or less limited to how far somebody could walk to get most of the things they needed in their daily life. And in fact, when by the time in the mid-19th century the final form of Paris was, was developed, you still had that neighborhood structure intact. In fact, each of these neighborhoods, the arrondissement, had, uh, had a town center. It had the shops and cafes. And basically, 80 to 90 percent of what 80 to 90 percent of the people needed in their daily life. And back then, uh, in, in, before the Industrial Revolution and, and, and even into the 20th century, early 20th century, the home really was the center of life in many ways. It was a center, center of entertainment, a center of learning, of energy production, of work, and of health care. Uh, and then with industrialization, things began to get distributed. You had uh, production going out to factories. They were often dirty and noisy. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so most commerce and production began to take place out of the home. You had uh, networks of rails and, and highways that were connecting uh, all of these distributed places to where people lived. Production was, was centralized. Uh, energy production was centralized. Healthcare was. Learning was. And, and uh, cities that evolved in the 20th century quite often lost that form. They lost their center. This is Houston. In fact, every, every little square uh, in red there is a parking lot or a parking deck. And so it, it actually uh, caused a disintegration of the urban form in many ways. This is what we, we end up with. In fact, in many urban areas, 40 percent of gasoline consumption and people driving around looking for parking spaces. So the, uh, the cars are really eating our, our cities. Uh, but it hasn't stopped there. Uh, we're, we're really moving into an era of extreme urbanization right now. In fact, many people say, the McKinsey Report says over the next 15 years, 300 million rural Chinese people will move uh, from the country to the city. That means building the equivalent of the entire housing stock and uh, mobility systems of the U.S. in 15 years in China. And this is what we're ending up with. We're not doing a very good job generally. We're ending up with tower sprawl. We have these in effect, single-purpose, high-density ghettos, uh, reliant on automobiles to connect them. The, these are, these are superblocks in China. This is a Google map image that I found. And so these are all residences. They have to drive somewhere to work. Typically, they're not connected by very good mass transit. You um, go to cities like Bangalore. I took this a few months. This is actually Bangalore on a good day. Uh, on a bad day, it wouldn't be a very interesting uh, image because nothing would be moving. But 15 years ago, uh, a friend of mine from Bangalore said these streets were filled with bicycles. Now they're mostly private automobiles and very few people. Uh, it was, so we're definitely reaching the, the limit of private automobiles in many of these cities. But it, it really is a new world now. I mean, things are changing. We have to rethink how we build uh, the places where live, people live and, and work and how they get between places. Uh, private work is becoming mostly mobile 
and distributed. Uh, the tra traditional office building is, is a dinosaur, many people say. I've heard Steelcase say this. Uh, many companies at a given time, uh, uh, a third of the, only a third of their workforce is, is in the workplace. Uh, usually these days doing things like this, what, what all of you are doing here, which is sharing ideas and, uh, and, and meeting, not doing private work. Uh, a third of work happens in, in third places like Starbucks. Uh, this photograph I take, you see everybody's back is to the wall. They're using their laptops. They have coffee uh, right right. Uh, Right down the uh, right down the store, they're they're in their sort of protected bubble, and many people are more comfortable doing doing work in these kind of third places. And a third uh, takes place at home. That means the home is as important a workplace as the workplace. And and interestingly, uh, we're returning to many of the patterns that we had before the industrial revolution, and and we can we have a possibility of reclaiming some of those lost values. So there are all these cities that are being designed from scratch. Uh, and the question is, how can you design more high-functioning, livable cities? This is a question we're very interested in. There's lots of schemes out there. This is one, the uh, Aerotropolis scheme, where you put, a, you put a, an airport in the center. And it's, uh, I think this makes sense for some Asian cities, but it's not really a model that I think scales very widely. We're, we're just beginning to work on two new so-called eco-cities in China. It's a partnership with Alto University, uh, funded by TECAS, the National uh, Funding Agency of Finland. They're two new cities uh, of 100,000 each, and they're intended to be a prototype. And we help them uh, develop this agenda. The Finns are putting up 60% of the equity, and they're motivated to, to do this right. And there are three types of networks they're thinking about, the digital networks, the ecological networks and the, and the physical networks. Uh, some of this is not very interesting, although I think they've done a pretty good job outlining where this should go. But let, let me just talk about a few of them, the physical networks. This was the plan, the, the land use plan that I first got actually last month. And I was actually quite appalled because the thinking was so primitive on this. You still have these, this uh, antiquated thinking about housing in these blocks and commercial in these blocks, industry at the perimeter. Uh, some industry needs to go at the perimeter, but much industry is clean. Uh, conceptually, in many cases, it needs to look more like this. We need to come up with more, much more agile strategies for bringing together the places where people live and work and play. But drilling down a little bit uh, further, it, it's interesting to look at how form evolved in China. This was the traditional urban fabric that you found before the 1920s. They imposed a grid in the 20s based on uh, modernist thinking uh, from Europe. Uh, they brought in more Soviet era thinking in the 1980s and have these six, seven story blocks. And now they have these high rise super blocks. Now what's particularly interesting though is if you look at the energy consumption in each of these forms, we're going in exactly the, the wrong direction. These first three are, are fairly similar, but this, this is roughly double the energy consumption of, per capita of the traditional forms. Uh, a lot of it is up here in, in mobility, and uh, uh, much of it is in use. The embodied energy, this upper bar, is about the same. So clearly, we, we need to do better. Uh, we're looking at strategies of bringing these traditional forms together with the density of these tower blocks and finding some kind of a hybrid model. Uh, it might look something like this, that uh, the places where people actually live in the street, it doesn't have to be hyper-traditional like this. It could be hyper-modernist. But nonetheless, in background, you have the functional spaces, the residential spaces and the workspaces. But you start with people. You start with people at the street and their experiences and their daily life. And we think, actually, if you, if you begin to bring together uh, advanced buildings, uh, time-shifted space, so you have much more efficient use of spaces, uh, concepts about shared-use vehicles and mobility on demand, uh, making cities walkable, we can dramatically shrink the performance, the, the energy consumption of, of, of these buildings. 
So we're looking at uh, actually b bringing in uh, a, a much more complex physical in infrastructure in the building. We're thinking about small, medium, large, extra large streets that all have special, special purposes. This is a little video I took in Melbourne a couple of months ago where they had these service alleys that were little used until 10 or 15 years ago. And they're beginning to evolve to other purposes, mostly it's because they changed the liquor laws. But, uh, but they also uh, allow tables out in the, in, in the street. And so you have these, these laneways that were filled with garbage. Now they're amazing spaces for people. And, it, and it, it informs how we might develop some agile infrastructure that can evolve organically and over time in these cities. Uh, medium spaces. This is what I think of as a mobility park. I shot this in Boulder, Colorado a few weeks ago. You can go the whole length of Boulder without crossing a street on a bicycle or, or jogging. You go under highways and under bridges along the river. It's actually quite a, quite a beautiful implementation of uh, some new way of getting, getting around the city. And we're hoping to do this in uh, some of the Chinese cities. Uh, in Seoul, Korea, the equivalent of their big dig, they took this elevated highway, scar running through the city, they removed it, they reclaimed uh, this riverbed, and it's a beautiful, beautiful space where people sit and read and work and children play, and uh, uh, you can, you can, it's a refuge away from the, the noise and the kind of the clutter of, of the city. On the other hand, you have our big dig. It, it, this was roughly uh, 15 times the budget. This was a $15 billion uh, traffic island. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's auto-centric, and it's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not a mobility space. It's not a space for people. Uh, it's one of the great missed opportunities, which is to say that we really do need to bring together good engineers, good designers, uh, artists, public participation to think about this new infrastructure. Uh, then you have the places of living. So what is that little apartment up there? That's one thing we're very interested in. Housing today is mostly generic commodities. But by using advanced technologies, if we understand your profile, if we understand how you work and maybe how well you can navigate from a wheelchair to a bathtub, this all forms part of your profile and we can use computational engines to configure spaces uh, in, in, a, in a more responsive way and integrate some uh, new types of technologies. This is actually personalized sunlight that we've been experimenting with. If we know your activities within the home, and we have an articulating mirror that you see there, we can place that sunlight anywhere in the space and then map your activities to that personalized sunlight and then the the mirror will uh, keep the sun in position throughout the day, mapped to that activity. Here Ronan actually decided to wash out the interface on his, uh, uh, on his uh, microwave. That's his choice, personalized sunlight. We can, we can also uh, think about supply chains that can uh, provide a, a wide range of different architectural technology service solutions to bring into the home. Uh, all enabled by new types of sensor networks and, uh, and uh, computational networks. Then there's the digital networks. And this is what most people are thinking about with smart cities. Uh, you have uh, a well-known Korean company that puts the human in the center. And if you notice, all of these around the perimeter are activities. They're not technologies. It's not biometrics. They're all... They're all uh, uh, dealing with different aspects of life. Uh, that's really a bottom-up process. You have a top-down process, which is IBM thinking about a control center where there's some alert when there's some problem in the city uh, using uh, the very similar networks. Uh, this was a um, slide from a deck from China Mobile where they're thinking about the wireless city. And if you notice there, promote the, the build-out and application of the Internet of Things and smart cities management. Cisco's doing much the same. BT, uh, Intel, they're all thinking about this infrastructure. Uh, we've been thinking about this for, for quite a while with respect to uh, mobility systems, where you take uh, an ecosystem of different types of, of vehicles, 
typically shared use, connected to mass transit. You understand the use profiles, the location. That data somehow goes to the cloud and enables all kinds of interfaces for trip planning and uh, persuasive interfaces to encourage mode shifts, et cetera. It's all quite, in, uh, quite interesting. Uh, for example, uh, to rebalance the system, you could offer incentives to go to drop off A rather than drop off B. It could be some association with a commercial venture. Lots of possibilities. Uh, and we've been working with the Korean uh, Transport Institute to try to flesh that out. Now, if you look at this, uh, you'll, you'll notice that there is uh, a box for applications connected to your smartphone. Uh, there's a, a journey planner. There's an information center, a reservation center. But uh, there are these three little boxes, which is the database. So where does this data go? And the questions that we're asking, and I don't think there are any good answers, and maybe uh, some of you could help us answer it. You know, who controls the data? Uh, where does the data reside? How can an individual understand and control the, the use? Uh, how can this data be used for societal benefit? And I think most importantly, how can we build trust networks that will make all kinds of useful services for cities acceptable to people? I think this is, we, we know how to design the vehicles. We know. We can imagine the interfaces. We can imagine many of the components. But I think these are the big questions now that we have to work on. Thank you.